He could see Bess's face floating before him. It wasn't the knife I wanted to put in you, he wanted to tell her. I picked you flowers, wild roses and pansy and golden cups. It took me all morning. His heart was thumping like a drum, so loud he feared it might wake the camp. Ice caked his beard all around his mouth. Where did that come from? With Bessa. Whenever he'd thought of her before, it had only been to remember the way she'd looked. Dying. What was wrong with him? He could hardly breathe. Had he gone to sleep? So in our previous parts, we've talked about how a mysterious actor has been influencing the story of Jon Snow. It sent dire wolves that ended up putting Jon on the wall. It led the Night's Watch to Whites, making Jon a hero and causing the Great Ranging. It influenced Mormont to stay at the Fist of the First Men when the others were scheduled to pass, leading to the Watch's decimation. And it interfered with an election to make Jon Lord Commander. The powerful actor seems to be creating the blue rose that is the chink in the Wall of Ice. That said, a chink in a wall is irrelevant if no one is there to exploit it. Which brings us to our other Night's Watch brother and his parallel tale. Let us turn our attention to the incredible and unlikely tale of Samuel Tarly. As I mentioned in part 3, John forms his unlikely friendship with Sam in the presence of Ghost. John is unusually open with Sam and has a eureka moment where he saves Sam, which not only makes Samuel Tarly the raven tender for Eamon, stealing the job from Chet, but also causes John to become the darling of Eamon and Mormont. Sam then, as the Raven Tender, is sent on the Great Ranging. Now, Samuel Tarly's adventures north of the Wall are unusual to say the least, and like John's, they seem to be influenced by a manipulating power. First off, once north of the Wall, it's actually Ghost who facilitates the first meeting between Gilly, John, and Sam in A Clash of Kings. And this meeting also weirdly involves Chet, the man whose Raven Tending job was taken. This is where we first meet Gilly. One of Craster's women was backed up against the mud-splattered wall of the keep. Keep away, she was shouting at Ghost. You, keep away! The direwolf had a rabbit in his mouth, and another dead and bloody on the ground before him. Get it away, my lord, she pleaded when she saw him. He won't hurt you. He knew at once what had happened. A wooden hutch, its slats shattered, lay on its side in the wet grass. He must have been hungry. We haven't seen much game. Now, it's important to note that John is ignoring half the picture here. Yes, Ghost has killed some rabbits, as a wolf will do, but John is ignoring the fact that Ghost is giving undue attention to Gilly. There is no obvious reason why Ghost has approached Gilly and driven her back against the keep. He has his dinner, the rabbits, after all. But the direwolf goes on to harass Gilly nonetheless. And while John is oblivious to this fact, the other Night's Watchmen do notice this attention. I'm no lord. But others had come crowding round, drawn by the woman's scream and the crash of the rabbit hutch. Don't you believe him, girl, called out Lark the sister men, a ranger mean as a cur. That's Lord Snow himself. Bastard of Winterfell and brother to kings, mocked Chet, who'd left his hounds to see what the commotion was about. That wolf's looking at you hungry, girl, Lark said. Might be it fancies that tender bit in your belly. And so this all brings up an interesting question. What on earth interests Ghost in Gilly? Why is it looking at her? This is suspicious as this is Gilly, the very girl who is about to give birth, thus bringing the others down from the north. Why would the direwolf be harassing her? Now also in this passage, we should note that Chet mentions something very interesting, that John is the brother of a king. This is important because it's that piece of information that convinces Gilly to later approach John's friend Sam, believing that kings protect people. Now, I will say, it's a bit odd that Chet even mentions that John is the brother of a king. Lark was making a joke about John being a lord because he's Lord Snow. We aren't sure why exactly Alistair Thorne chose the nickname for John. It's likely to highlight how John acts highborn but is really a bastard. Regardless, the name certainly has nothing to do with John's brother Rob, who took his kingship after the nickname was given. And yet, for some reason, Chet introduces this vital piece of information, which changes everything. Gilly approaches Sam, and Sam gets in his head that he might take her baby. The very baby that the others are coming for. Now, I will admit, Chet's comment by itself seems rather innocuous. Yes, it's odd, but it's not completely off-topic. One could see someone acting snobby due to having a royal brother. Still, we should absolutely wonder about Chet's actions, as at least later on, 
it's pretty darn certain that someone is messing with Chet's head. Let's move on to the prologue of A Storm of Swords, where Chet is planning a mutiny. So our third book opens with the looming threat of Chet's mutiny, as he and his comrades are not happy with the Mormon's decision to fight the coming wildlings. The mutiny involves 14 brothers, though we only know the identity of a dozen. They are Chet, Lark the Sisterman, Clubfoot Carl, Dirk, Alo Lophand, Lark's cousin Raleigh of Sisterton, another one of Lark's cousins, Small Paul, Softfoot, Sweet Donald Hill, Maslin, and Sawwood. Now, I've brought up these names for a reason, and we will get back to them later on. Anyway, Chet's group plans to kill various members of the Night's Watch, including Gior Mormont and Sam Tarley, and then desert the Watch. Each man has a dream of life after fleeing the Night's Watch, some wanting to return home, but Chet has a different plan. It's Chet's dream, oddly enough, to kill Craster, take over Craster's keep, and claim Craster's wives for himself. This is an important point, as Chet's plan is ridiculously stupid. No, not murdering members of the Night's Watch and fleeing, that's fine. The astoundingly dumb idea is taking over Craster's Keep. Craster, after all, is a friend of the Night's Watch, and Craster's Keep is a somewhat regular stop for Night's Watch Rangers. It's an outpost that has made a life or death difference for Rangers many times. It would only be a matter of time until the Night's Watch stopped by the Keep, discovered Chet's crime, and brought him to justice for desertion. Chet's dream is idiocy, and quite unlike his fairly well thought out plan for his mutiny. So what on earth was he thinking? Well, whatever was going on in Chet's head, it was among some other very unusual thoughts. And Chet himself says so. Take this passage when he thinks about Craster, but now he meant to take it back, and Craster's women too. That twisted old wildling has the right of it. If you want a woman to wife, you take her. And none of this giving her flowers so that maybe she don't notice your bloody boils. Chet didn't mean to make that mistake again. As you can see, woven into Chet's thoughts about Craster are his thoughts of Bessa, the girl he murdered and whose murder put him on the wall. And yet Chet himself thinks it's unusual that he's thinking about Bessa. He could see Bessa's face floating before him. It wasn't the knife I wanted to put in you, he wanted to tell her. I picked you flowers. Wild roses and pansy and golden cups. It took me all morning. His heart was thumping like a drum, so loud he feared it might wake the camp. Ice caked his beard all around his mouth. Where did that come from? With Bessa. Whenever he'd thought of her before, it had only been to remember the way she'd looked. Dying. What was wrong with him? He could hardly breathe. Had he gone to sleep? So by Chet's own internal judgment, there's something seriously wrong. He's having unusual thoughts about Bessa, and they're wrapped up in idiotic thoughts about Craster. And this scene certainly parallels the scene later on in A Storm of Swords, when John has his mind messed with by Ghost. John sees Catalan's floating face, oddly remembers declaring himself Lord of Winterfell with Rob, and then suicidally decides to stay with the Night's Watch, fully expecting to be hanged. And with both John and Chet, we also have these characters losing time. Keep in mind, this scene with Chet takes place after a huge rally with the Night's Watch, but before dinner and before second watch. It's on third watch that Chet's mutiny is to take place. Now, we don't know if the Night's Watch breaks up their nights into three or four watches, but it makes little difference. A three-watch structure places second and third watch at 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. respectively. A four-watch structure places second and third watch at 9 p.m. and midnight. The point being, Chet is losing time fairly early in the evening, sometime before 10 p.m., most likely earlier since it seems to be before dinner. Not to mention, Chet is awaiting a mutiny where he is to murder someone, and his head is full of worries of all of the things that can go wrong. There is no way he accidentally fell asleep. Not this early, and not on such an eventful, nerve-wracking night. And again, Chet himself recognizes that something's wrong with himself. It's almost certain that Chet's head is being messed with, which makes one wonder, was the mention of John being the brother of a king really Chet's own thought? Was the mutiny really Chet's own thought? And was the incredibly stupid plan to kill Craster and take over Craster's keep really Chet's own thought? And I will say, that last thought, the plan to kill Craster, is doubly suspicious as it's not just his idiotic plan, but it becomes the idiotic plan of his fellow conspirators as well. Let's transition from our first mutiny in A Storm of Swords, Chet's, to our second mutiny, the mutiny at Craster's Keep. 
Now, as I went over in part two of the rigged election of Jon Snow, the brothers' minds at Craster's Keep are definitely being messed with during this event, as members of the Night's Watch were massively hungry and demanding food when there was plenty of food to go around. The brothers are literally being fed roasted horse while complaining they don't have rock-hard sausages. And this hunger seems to be induced by Mormont's Raven. We first see it with Sam's fantasies switching from death to food, then Sam becoming overcome by hunger at Bannon's funeral, and then during the sparking of hostilities against Craster. They all accompany the Raven's calls. The Raven, like Ghost with John, seems to be causing hunger. But beyond this mysterious hunger, I'd like to focus on the participants of the mutiny at Craster's Keep. They were Clubfoot Carl, Dirk, Alo Lophand, Lark's cousin Raleigh, Alan of Rosby, Muttering Bill, Garth of Greenaway, Grubbs, Monty, and Orphan Oss. If you notice, the first four men, Carl, Dirk, Alo, and Raleigh, were all part of Chet's conspiracy, and now they're participating in a second conspiracy. And who's to say how many more from Chet's conspiracy would have participated had they not died? Chet, Lark, Small Paul, Softfoot, and Maslin are all confirmed dead at this point, and we never hear from the second sister and cousin or Sawwood ever again. In fact, as far as we know, all of the surviving Chet mutineers become Craster's keep mutineers, save one, Sweet Donald Hill. And in fact, it's Dirk, Carl, and Allo who are the first instigators and apparent leaders of the conflict at Craster's Keep. Dirk is first upset over the death of Bannon, blaming Craster. Of course, this is rather odd, as Bannon was marked for death in Chet's conspiracy, so Dirk shouldn't care one bit if the man died. But for some reason, Dirk seems to want to find fault with Craster. On a related note, earlier Garth of Greenaway weirdly disapproves of Craster beating one of his daughters, only to participate in the raping of daughters later on. Again, there seems to be a desire to find fault with Craster. Whatever the case, Dirk, Carl, and Allo then start complaining about food. Carl calls Craster a bastard, then Dirk kills Craster, and Allo kills Mormont. Now again, I'd like to point out how unusual this whole situation is. Dirk is described as a calm man, and yet here he is losing his temper over a man he shouldn't care about. And we know that Raleigh and Alo Lopan wanted to return home, and yet here they are, the men of Chet's conspiracy, becoming hostile towards Craster for whatever reason they can, and then enacting Chet's idiotic dream of taking over Craster's keep. A dream that, as far as we know, was never communicated to them by Chet. It's all incredibly odd, with Mormont's raven presiding over it all. And of course, it's during the mutiny at Craster's Keep that Sam loses time. Later, much later, Sam found himself sitting cross-legged on the floor, with Mormont's head in his lap. He did not remember how they'd gotten there, or much of anything else that had happened after the old bear was stabbed. So Sam loses time, a significant amount of time, and this all happens with Mormont's raven sitting right next to Sam. Of course, it's rather significant that Sam does lose time, as had he not, he would have done what a normal person would have done and run off with his friends when they fled earlier and tried to get him to come with them. Instead, Sam, a cowardly man, stays behind in a room filled with violent rapists and murderers. It's only when he is commanded to flee with Gilly, the very same girl that Ghost was interested in and the very same girl whose child the others are coming for, that Sam takes action. Take the girl and be quick about it. Quack, the raven said. Quack, quack. Quack. Where? asked Sam, puzzled. Where should I take her? Someplace warm, the two old women said as one. It's important to note that Mormont's raven is integrated into the commanding process, and that Craster's wives, in unison, speak the line someplace warm, almost as if they are sharing a thought. Now, so far, all of the supernatural influence on the Sam story has been on the subtle side, but it becomes rather explicit after this. After Whites come for Gilly's baby, Sam and Gilly are rescued from Whites by a massive conspiracy of ravens and are put under the protection of Cold Hands, an undead servant of Blood Raven and the Children of the Forest. So at least for the final part of Sam's journey north of the Wall, it is certain who the manipulating force is. Blood Raven and the Children of the Forest helped Sam and Gilly escape with a baby meant for the others. And it's quite an impressive rescue, really, logistically speaking. Sam is rescued just in the nick of time from Whites by Ravens and Cold Hands, and then is delivered to Bran the very day he arrives at the Night Fort. Sam is then able to let Bran through the wall, facilitating Bran's trip to Blood Raven. 
The Puppet Master must have been planning this rescue for some time. Now I will say, this rescue does shed some light on our Puppet Master's motives. He clearly wanted Sam, Gilly, and the Babe to escape the Whites, and there seemed to be some interest in Gilly and the Babe back at Craster's Keep, both from Ghost the first time, and Mormont's Raven the second time. And knowing this desire to save Sam, Gilly, and the Babe, we now have a motive for Mormont's Raven causing all of the hunger and injecting Chet's dream into the mutineers. By killing Craster, an opportunity is created for Sam to escape with Gilly and the Babe, and for John to rise to Lord Commander, and for Bran to get through the wall. And if we go back to the Fist of the First Men, we see the seeds of the mutiny at Craster's Keep in Chet's mutiny and the mind of Chet. It's a hostility towards Mormont and a dream of killing Craster. This grows and leads to the mutiny at Craster's Keep, which in turn leads to Sam's escape with Gilly and the Babe. And we definitely see plenty of other things related to Chet's mutiny that go incredibly well for Sam, that help him survive and fulfill his goal of rescuing Gilly and the Babe. For example, Sam fully admits that he would have never survived the trek to Craster's Keep had Small Paul not decided to carry him. But Small Paul is only carrying Sam because he is inexplicably obsessed with Mormont's raven, wants to own him, and thinks Sam will gift it to him. Except it's not Sam who actually promised the bird to Small Paul, it's Chet. What about the bird? What bloody bird? The last thing he needed now was some muttonhead going on about a bird. The old bear's raven, Small Paul said. If we kill him, who's gonna feed his bird? Who bloody well cares? Kill the bird too if you like. I don't want to hurt no bird, the big man said. But that's a talking bird. What if he tells what we did? Lark the sister man laughed. Small Paul, thick as a castle wall, he mocked. You shut up with that said Small Paul dangerously. Paul, said Chet, before the big man got too angry. When they find the old man lying in a pool of blood with his throat slit, they won't need no bird to tell them someone killed him. Small Paul chewed on that a moment. That's true, he allowed. Can I keep the bird then? I like that bird. He's yours, said Chet, just to shut him up. So Small Paul is inexplicably focused on Mormont's raven, a raven that we suspect has been messing with people's heads, and it's this focus that ends up saving Sam. We know Chet's mind was being messed with at the Fist of the First Men, as was Lark, Dirk, and Allos at Craster's Keep. It appears another of Chet's conspirators, Small Paul, was affected by the Raven as well. Now last time I mentioned various lucky things that happened for Sam to survive the Fist and use his dragon glass on another. And one of those things was being carried by Small Paul, which we know is really dependent on Mormont's Raven. Now, there are holes in Sam's memory with him losing time, so it's tough to say how exactly Sam, say, gained a horse, found courage, and lost his horse to a mystery person, but there is one more thing that happened to Sam at the Fist of the First Men that was dependent on Ravens. The losing of his sword. Let's piece together the events. So, while at the Fist, we do see Sam with his sword out in the middle of the action, but he is then commanded by Mormont to go tend the Ravens. And so Sam goes to write messages for the birds, where we can safely assume he sets down his sword to use his quill. He then releases the ravens, and realizes that he forgot to attach the messages. Now, the ravens are a rowdy bunch, and we see them fly furiously into the sky. But then, weirdly, two ravens are back, sitting on a nearby rock. So these two ravens decided to fly off into the sky, and then fly all the way back. Sam, thinking he can catch one of these ravens, then chases it, and it flies off, not with the energy of before, but lazily. And Sam finds himself ten feet from the ring wall, as the men are ordered to mount their horses. This means that Sam's sword was left back where he'd begun the chase. And so we do know why Sam lost his sword. Because of the ravens. And so when it comes down to it, a tremendous amount of the Sam story is reliant on ravens, direwolves, and people doing odd things because of ravens and direwolves. And all of it leads to the mutiny at Craster's Keep, and Sam escaping with Gilly and her baby. And we should also not overlook how significant these events could be. Sam killed an other with Dragonglass, and he ran off with a baby meant for the others. And as I theorized in The Secrets of Craster's Keep, it may be that this agreement to supply babies was not just Craster's alone, but one fully sanctioned by the Night's Watch to replace the sacrifice of babies once occurring at the Night Fort. Sacrifices that went back to the founding of the Wall and the peace with the Others. When it comes down to it, these are remarkably hostile actions towards the Others. And this brings us to the big picture goal of our Puppet Master. 
Now that we've gone over nearly every aspect of the John and Sam story north of the wall, we can pull all the pieces together. And we will do that in our final part of our series, the last installment of The War of the Raven, the last installment of The Night's Watch. We will see you in part six. Thanks for watching.